table. Let's take a win in this competition. How is that? I'm gonna step down. So is it okay if I step down? You still be there? Okay. I don't want to get that weird screeching sound. So, uh, I'm gonna do all one minute. All right, one minute. How many minutes? One minute. We're gonna see which table will come up with the most ingredients that you believe in this can. We got one minute. One minute. All right, and we're gonna start, and so we might have somebody write it down if you can't remember all of that. So we're gonna start right now. Five, four, three, two, one. Stop. All right, stop writing. I'm talking. Anybody, any table in here get, let's start off with 10. Anybody get 10? You got eight. Did anybody else get eight? Yeah, y'all got eight or nine? Eight? 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 Y'all got nine? We got ten. <laughs> Y'all got ten? Let's hear it. Let's hear it. We, we got it. We got it. We got it. Okay, let's hear it. Let's hear it. We got salt, water, tomato paste, tomatoes, sugar, glucose, MSG, and other preservatives. That's pretty good. Did, did one of these tables have something that they did not say? That you want to add to it? Yeah. Um, we said artificial flavor. That's in everything. Artificial flavor. Yeah. How about here? Yeah. Um, uh, citric acid. So all together collectively between these three tables, what is that like? Fifteen? Around? Uh, anyway, it's a three-way tie. <laughs> we'll come back to that a little bit later. So uh, I'm, uh, my name is Jonathan Moore. I'm from Detroit, Michigan. Any Detroit right now? No, Midwest. Midwest folks. Okay, I'll take that. From Detroit, I grew up on the northwest side of Detroit. I grew up in a neighborhood that was filled with uh, a lot of craziness, to say the least, a lot of negativity. A lot of violence. Uh, I mean, you name it, it was going on in my in my neighborhood. Uh, one of the things though that my dad and my mom, particularly my dad, though, was, was very intentional about was making sure that my brothers and I were exposed to more than just what was going on in our neighborhood. Very intentional about that. So they didn't make a lot of money, but whenever they had the opportunity, they would uh, allow my brothers and I to have experiences. So one of the things my dad did at a very young age was he introduced us to the world of sports. And so my brothers and I, I'm in the middle, I got an older brother, younger brother, and so uh, any sport you can name, you can think of, that the local YMCA was offering, my dad threw us in. I mean, you name it, tennis, it, uh, track, volleyball, swimming, um, I mean, you name it, the list goes on. And so uh, when I was eight, years later, I asked my dad, I said, why do you do that. Why did you have to involved in some of these movies? Honestly, I was just trying to keep you guys focused on something other than what was going on in our neighborhood to keep you guys busy. When I was eight, uh, studying together, I'll never forget this. My dad, he said, we're going to a Detroit Lions game. So he put us in the car. We went to go see the Detroit Lions on Thanksgiving Day. I saw this guy named Barry Sanders play for the first time. If you've never heard of him, I suggest you YouTube him. He's the second, arguably, the greatest running back to ever put on a football helmet. So this guy played, and, and it was like watching poetry on a football field. And my brothers and I, before we left that game, we were begging our dad, please sign us up for football. This is what we want to do. And we had to do some convincing. My mom eventually agreed, and that following year, he signed us up for the West Side Rockets. I was nine years old. And at that point, I made the decision that I was going to be a football player. I made the decision that I was going to go to the NFL. I set the goal of not only going to the NFL, but having a long career like my other childhood hero, Jerry Rice. And so I started on this journey at the age of nine. And a lot of you all, especially college student athletes, former student athletes, you know what that's like, right? To have that, that vision, to have that drive, to have that focus. And you so focused on something that it, 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 it pretty much consumes you. And that was me. Had some success in high school. Was able to earn a scholarship to the University of Wisconsin. Was there five years. Had some success there. And then in 2006, I'm watching the NFL draft. I get a call from Coach Jeff Fisher of the Tennessee Titans. He said, Jonathan, how you doing? This is Coach Fisher from the Titans. I said, Coach, I'm doing good. He said, how would you like to be a Tennessee Titan? Come on down to Nashville. I said, I don't know a lot about country music, but I could learn. I, I, I can learn to get used to it. Sure enough, three picks later, Tennessee Titans with the 172nd pick in this year's NFL draft, like Jonathan Moore, wide receiver, University of Wisconsin. And I had a dream 
that that nine-year-old had was now a reality. Matter of fact, a couple days after I got drafted, I got a call from Tamara Allison. Everybody say, hey, Tammy. Hey, Tammy. <laughs> Tammy called me, Tammy and I, still friends to this day, we work together. She said, John, guess what I found? I said, what did you find, Tammy? She said, you won't believe what I found. I said, girl, what did you find? She said, I found a picture that you gave me when you were in fourth grade. I said, you called me and told me that? She said, yeah, but guess what it says on the back? Tammy, what does it say? I got things to do, girl. Hurry up. She said, you won't look for me in the NFL by 2005. It was 2006. I didn't know about red shirt in the fourth grade. So my math was a little off. But I didn't even remember writing that, but it reinforced Again, how focused and how serious I was about accomplishing this goal. So you can imagine my level of disappointment, my level of discouragement, my level of shocking. After a couple years in the NFL, just like that, it was over. This thing that I had given so much of my life to, this thing that I really couldn't even remember my life without, this thing that was such a big part of my life, was now over. And for the next couple of years, I struggled severely. I got married after my, my rookie year in the NFL. And uh, I remember maybe about six months after the NFL, my wife coming to me like, who are you? You are not the guy that I married a year ago. And the truth is, she was right, right? I, I didn't, I couldn't put in the words what I was experiencing because I had never been in this place before. All I knew was that it was rough. I was experiencing things internally, right? I, I was having struggles being separated from this thing that was such a big part of my life. And I didn't know how to move forward. I got stuck, like so many athletes do. And so, years later, I, find, I, re I realized that I'm not the only one, right? It's all kind of research uh, that's being done. It seems like every couple of years, some new reports come out, studying athletes and their transition, and all of that is awesome. Um, we actually, our organization, we did a study with uh, William James College, small college out of Boston. Uh, we did some research a couple of years ago, and so, um, so the research accompanied by so many of the uh, this folks I knew personally, former athletes, men and women across sports, former teammates uh, from college, professionally, were having similar struggles. We're having similar struggles, having a hard time moving forward in life. And so what I want to do in the next 20 minutes, I want to talk about uh, some of the common challenges, real quick, the common challenges that athletes face. This, again, this is based on research and some of you may have experienced or if you work with athletes, I'm sure you've seen some of it. So the common challenges that I want to give you with some keys, three or five keys, depending on how much, we, how much time we have, that will, uh, that will hopefully help you or help you to help others, all right? The first challenge is what I like to call a transition ignorance. Everybody say transition ignorance. <laughs> Every athlete is aware of the fact, just about probably 99 point something percent of athletes is aware of the fact that they will not play their sport in the capacity in which they play it in all their life. You'd be hard pressed to find an athlete who thinks they'll be 100 years old, still competing at the level you're competing at. You'd be hard pressed. So every athlete understands that this change will occur. But very few athletes understand that this change is also accompanied by a transition. So for years, I used to think change and transition were the same thing. I used to use them interchangeably. They're different. Change is what happens external, right? It's differences uh, in your external situation. For example, your eligibility will expire. You no longer have to go to practice. You no longer have to lift. You no longer have to compete. You no longer have to do certain things all external. And every athlete knows that those changes will occur. But the transition is what catches us off guard. That is the internal stuff that you're dealing with as a result of the change that you're experiencing. And that's what nobody prepared us for. You knew you wouldn't have to go to practice. You knew you would not have to, again, eat a certain way. You knew that was going to happen, but nobody prepares us for the mental stuff, right? Nobody prepares us for the for the for the for the, 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 the anxiety that comes with it, all of the internal, the emotional stuff. Nobody prepares us for that. And that's oftentimes what catches up in each other. So that's the first one. Transition ignorance. Transition ignorance. Number two is a uh, false sense of identity, right? It's been talked about a few times here today, a lost sense of identity. Again, oftentimes our identity, we've had this uh, tunnel vision, right? We've been in this tunnel for so long in this vacuum, pursuing our athletic goals, in pursuit of doing that, a lot of times we neglect our holistic identity. We neglect uh, who we, to see ourselves holistic. 
and that could present all kinds of problems, right? During your athletic journey as well as after. And then the third one is, is career challenges. We have a life coaching uh, department uh, in our organization and, and mental health services as well, but oftentimes athletes come and, and uh, I'm having career challenges. When we dig a little deeper, we see oftentimes there's two things, one of two things. One, a lack of uh, direction, right? Where do I go? Do I go back to school? Do I go home? Do I stay where I'm at? A lack of direction, or this is the big one, a lack of career fulfillment. A lack of career fulfillment. So it's not necessarily finding a job, but it's, it's finding something that gives you life. The reason why you play your sport when you play your sport is because something about it gives you life. Something about it makes you feel alive. Now to go from that and to find any old regular job that doesn't fulfill you in that way, that, that can be rough. All right? So those are the top three that I wanted to talk about. Now I want to talk a little bit about the keys, right, for overcoming those and uh, So the first one, well, uh, let me ask a question first. Where's the table that had me, this table back here? I have a question for you all. How come, when we did the icebreaker, we had the little competition, how come you did not say, anybody can raise their hand at that table, how come you did not say beef? Then one better was beef at Good answer. Okay, how come? At this table, how come none of you said potatoes? Because what? Because you know what comes in the tomato can because you've had it before. Fair enough. This table, that word in the tie, how come none of you said green beans? Now it's about to get interesting. Okay, how come nobody, anybody can answer this? How come nobody said peas? Same answer pretty much there by us then? Who remembers the original question? It was what's in this hand? I said, I'm gonna give you one minute to come up with as many ingredients that you can come up with that you believe is in this hand. And you all said what you said based on what? Based on this label. You assume that what this can had to offer was tomato soup. What it had on the inside of it was tomato soup. So this is the first point. You have to, right? You have to remove the label of athlete home. You have to remove the label of athlete. Because in this can is actually, you all see that vegetable beef. So it has beef. I gotta come down for this jumping up there. It has beef. It has. Let's read it. It has beef. It has not just beef. It has freaking seasoned beef. Seasoned beef. We got potatoes. We got carrots. We got peas. We got green beans. We got celery. And the list goes on. But the label had you to see. You thought all this can had to offer. Water, sugar, salt, sugar, 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 nasty tomato soup. Unless you like tomato soup, I don't. But if you like it, no offense. All right. So that's the first thing, man. Listen, I can guarantee you, somewhere along your journey between first picking up a ball or stepping on the track or diving in the pool and where you are, where you are today, someone has tried to put a label on, it, and that label is athlete only, oh, right? It, athlete will always be part of who you are, always. It should not be your defining way. It should not be your main way. And that's where we get into trouble, right? We allow ourselves to be labeled. And it could have been the media, it could have been society, it could have been coaches, it could have been family members, it could have been yourself, but a lot of times we don't realize that we adopt those labels. We allow those labels to define us. A few years ago, a lady told LeBron James to shut up and dribble. Y'all remember that? She said, shut up and dribble, LeBron. What she was saying was basically, LeBron, you are a basketball player. That is all you have to offer. So if you want to say anything, I don't want to hear anything you have to say about the uh, political stuff or about socioeconomic. I don't want to hear any of that stuff. You are a basketball player, so if you are not dunking on somebody, if you are not, or if you, if you are not crossing somebody over, I don't want to hear it. That's the box I'm putting you in. Thankfully, LeBron understands that's not his primary label. So that's the first key, right? Remove the labels. If you allow yourself to be labeled as a Basketball, softball, whatever. If that's your primary label, you have to remove that because you will never fully understand 
all the greatness you have on the inside of you, that you have other gifts, other talents, other abilities, other things God put you on this earth to do besides your soul. That's number one. That's number one. Number two. Woo! I love this. How much time do you have? Damn, we got 10 minutes. Okay, self exploration. Prioritize self exploration. This is, this is big. What do I mean by that? Self exploration, one way I like to define it, it's, it's the process of discovering the different pieces that complete the you puzzle, right? It's, 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 it's understanding that yes, a big part of you is, is, is athlete, but there's other aspects that make you who you are. Particularly, I'm talking about your other passions, your other gifts, your other talents, your other abilities, right? Your values. Let's just, let's just pause for a second and talk about passion. Talk about passion, right? In other words, the stuff that you care about. Again, a lot of times we've been so focused on our sport that we neglect or never even realize or put on the back burner the other passions, the other things God put on the inside of us and we neglect them. It's time to rediscover those things. It's a reason, I always say, you did not choose your passion, right? You have that for a reason. Nobody wakes up and says, I'm gonna be passionate about this. No, it's clues to what you're supposed to be doing in life. So don't neglect that, right? Discover that. Prioritize self-discovery. Figure out what else you're good at. I can guarantee you, as good as you are in your sport, you have other gifts and talents that you're just as good at and not better. It's time to prioritize discovering those things, tap into those things. And then what that does is it leads to what I like to call Woo! the intersection of fulfillment. The intersection of fulfillment. Again, a lot of times it's not getting a job, but it's, it's a lot of time People in general, but we're talking about how we do that, end up in jobs for the wrong reasons, and we're so discouraged, and it sucks. We'll spend 20 years in a career going to a job. Week. Have you ever had a job, and you get, you drive there, and then you just sit in the car like, shut me going in today. Anybody ever had that? Right? I don't want that. I don't want that for you. But by prioritizing self-discovery, it leads you to your intersection of fulfillment. This is where your gifts and talents, right? Your 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 uh, your passions and your um your values, right? The stuff that's important to you. So what you care about, what you're good at, and and what's important to you, where all of those align. Where all of those align. Where all those converge. Where all those intersect. And those are the opportunities that you want to seek out. Does that make sense? Because that's fulfillment. That's fulfillment. I never forget Kobe Bryant. He had been out of the NBA probably about two years. And I'm a huge Kobe fan, been a Kobe fan since I was like 12 years old. Uh, I was more impressed with what Kobe did after the NBA. After the NBA, because just being in this field for the last almost nine years, I just, I, I, I gravitate towards like athletes in their transition. And normally when somebody has, has accomplished what somebody like Kobe has accomplished, it's hard for them to move on. And so I never forget, over those two years, every time I would see Kobe, he seemed really fulfilled, which was just odd. It was just odd to me. Like Kobe seemed really fulfilled. There's a lot of professional athletes who go on and, and make a lot of money in business. And I'm not talking about that. He was generally fulfilled. And I'll never forget, I'm sitting there watching the first take one day, and I see uh, Stephen A. Smith. Stephen A. Smith. I see Stephen A. Smith. My mom was probably right back. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> Stephen A. Smith, uh, he's sitting there, he's like, Kobe, I don't get it, man. You know how Stephen A. Smith all is. Kobe, I don't get it. You don't see them as basketball. When the last time you played? And Kobe's like, last time I played was when I hit 60. And he was like, see when they snap, you know, doing the most. Kobe, are you serious when you hit 60? What's the secret? And Kobe, I never forget what he said. He said, you know, it's a blessing. He said, I don't miss it. He said, I took the time to figure out what else I was passionate about just as much as basketball while I was still playing. Mm, he can stop right here. You know what, you cut off them like 50 go. Listen, he said, I took the time to, to figure out, to discover what else I was passionate about just as much as basketball. And so when that basketball lane came to an end, he was able to just shift lanes because for years, he had been exploring what else he can put on this earth to do, the storytelling, the animation. So we got to do the same thing, all right? Five minutes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Let's do this. Number three. Mm. Identify your. No, I think you 
you have to describe that. Uh, let's look at this. Identify your identity foundation. Identify your identity foundation. What do I mean by that? A few years ago, my wife and I, we had four kids under the age of four. I'm sorry, three kids under the age of four. We were losing our mind. It was crazy. We had just moved from one state to another state. I was working a lot. She was at home with the kids. And, and it was our anniversary was coming up. And normally, Dr. Big, I'm a simple guy when it comes to anniversary. I don't do too much. You know, dinner and a movie, uh, flowers, you know, and a nice, nice, nice meal. That's me. I'm trying to stay in my life. But I said, you know what? This has been a rough year. I'm going to step my husband in. So I called my parents. I said, Mom and Dad, you think you can watch the kids? They said, yeah, no problem. And so, like any responsible parents, <clears throat> dropped our kids off and moved to Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> and we had the time of our life. You know, the thing about Vegas, you don't need to be there too long, right? Like, anything other than three days, they say, you how about from here? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's just too much. But we were there a perfect amount of time, but the point of contention for my wife and I never failed. Whenever we go on vacation, never fail. Still to this day, uh, we always have a uh, disagreement. I'm, I'm going to keep it real. We have a heart every time. Because my wife is a wife. She likes to have every single hour of every single day. She, she'll come to me with an agenda. Like, this is what we're doing. I'm more of a go with the flow type of guy. Right? If I want to spend afternoon and just put my toes in the pool, that's what I want to do. Right? But she comes to me, she says, Jonathan, tomorrow, this is what we're doing. It was this full day tour of Las Vegas. It was like eight hours. And it takes us outside. Of it. I'm like, we're only here a couple days. Let's not do that. She said, well, what do you suggest? I said, well, how about we meet in the middle? We just do this little, I think it was like three or four hours to get to the main park. So we debrief. It was double decker bus tour. We're sitting on the top deck and we're having the time of our life. <clears throat> and I'll never forget. We're going down the, uh, the, the, the strip, the North Strip, I think it was, and the tour guide, he was awesome. He's like, look out the window to your right. That's the MGM Grand. And he talked about the history of it and the boxing matches that took place here. And I'm just taking my hands. I love that. So, look out the window to your left. This is the Bellagio. And I look at this hotel. And it's just like I've been seeing on movies for years. It's big. It's beautiful. It's, it's breathtaking. Look out to your right. That's for me. They found this movie here. And he's giving the history. About all of these hotels, and, and, and I'm going away. And then we get to the end of that strip. He says, uh, Look to your left. I have to be looking to my right. And I saw this other hotel. And it was just as big, just as beautiful as all the ones you just saw. It's one thing different. It was completely empty. Totally empty. Nobody was on the grass. Nobody was walking up and down the sidewalk. It was high. And so I got up, I went to the tour guide, I said, oh, This is a tour guide. What's, what's going on with that hotel? And he looked at me with a look of disappointment in his eyes. He said, that's the honor. That was supposed to be the next biggest, greatest hotel. But it's going to close in a few months. They're going to tear it down. And it never even opened. It took seven years to build. Hundreds of millions of dollars. They're going to tear it down and it never even opened. So now I'm going to I said, Mr. Tour Guy. Why in the world would they do that? He said, well, during the last inspection, officials went in and they determined that the Harmon did not have sufficient rebar. I had no idea what that pulled out my phone right there. Boom, what is the definition of rebar? Rebar is short for reinforcement. It is essential to the foundation of a building. So if the building did not have proper rebar, if an earthquake happened, just the wear and tear over the years, that building could very well come to pieces, killing army people inside. So it's serious enough that they cannot allow that building to open. What does that have to do with athletes? A lot of times, as athletes, we're the same way. The foundation of our identity is insufficient because it's athletes. It's, it's, it's insufficient because it's, it's basketball, because it's soccer. Field. Just like that hotel when the storms of life come, right? When you go through that transition, when you go through an injury, if that's the foundation of your identity, the thing you attach yourself, words yourself, so value, you your purpose to, if that's the foundation of your identity, then you can very well grow. So what's happening is we have to reestablish our identity foundation. 
So you don't have to always be part of who you are. It should not be the, your primary idea. You think you do in your life. Why? Why is that? Because it's temporary, right? It's based on performance. That's why it's fragile. That's why it's insufficient. You won't do it forever. If this is the thing, you place all your identity, you put all your identity in in this after basket, then when, it, when it's stripped away, what do you have? So uh, I can't tell you what, what your core identity, right, the foundation of your identity should be, but I can offer this. If it's based on performance, and if it's temporary, it's insufficient. All right. I'll share this. Dang, I'm in there. And I have two more. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sure. All right. So, so, so I'll share this. For me, a lot of people always ask for me afterwards, like, so what was it for you? True story, man. I, I had a, a very low moment uh, where I realized, and finally, and I'll share this afterwards. You know, but don't have time to get into the story. But this is when I discovered. That, man, I really have some issues. Just because I don't play football anymore doesn't mean I should be experiencing all of this. <clears throat> and starting on this journey of, of self discovery, right? And assessing my identity, and I finally realized, like, man, my identity comes from who I am in God. That's it. Right? For me, and I'm not trying to convert you by anything like that, but that's what it was for me. That, that, that provided me, that was a turning point. That provided me a solid foundation that I can now build. Build my life. That would never change. I could lose all my money, I could lose all my family, I could lose everything. Else, right? But that that would still be it. I didn't even use the practice. So um, you all have been awesome. Thank you so much. A couple of resources real quick. Uh, so our organization we provide a lot of uh, different programs and, and services to help athletes in their transition and to help them well before the transition. We do stuff in the high school space and the college space and the post space. Um, one particular uh, opportunity we have for, for those of you who are college students or administrators, we have a free <clears throat> transition program that we're taking 56 colleges this year for free on campus. Uh, so if you're interested in that, um, see me afterwards. I have a card and then it has a QR code on it. You scan that QR code and it has information about that if you're interested in that. Um, also, I wrote a book called Games Over Life's Not the Athletes Got from Transitioning. It's on uh, Amazon. I actually have some if you want one. Today is, is, is free. Come see me. There's also some other good books. My man Taj right here has an incredible book uh, that's available. Some of the name of it real quick, Taj. Thrive After Sports. It's on Amazon. It's, it's incredible. So there's a lot of research. Derek in here? Yes, sir. Derek, some name of your book here. Uh, what's Next? How to Transition Like a Champion. What's Next? How to Transition Like a Champion. So it's a lot of resources. You know that you are not alone. Seek support if you need it. Sorry, I went over my time. You all have been awesome. Thank you.